Good morning, everyone. My name is Myra Alvarez, and I'm Director of Public Health Policy in the Office of Health Reform at the Department of Health and Human Services. And on behalf of the department and the administration, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our town hall on women's health. We'd like to thank the White House for helping us to organize and host this important event, and especially thank those of you here with us in the room and the many online viewers and social media participants and followers for joining us via Twitter and Facebook. Just to make sure we're all on the same page, I want to remind participants and viewers to pose questions on Twitter using the hashtag Women's Health. For any questions we are unable to address live today, we will try to follow up online after the event to make sure you get the information you need. Uh, so each of us participating in this town hall today has a special woman in our lives. For this woman, today is extra special for me. I get to give thanks to a woman who brought me into this world. My mother was key to my health as a child, and even to this day, her support and her love are vital to my well-being. And for all of us, whether it's our mother, our grandmother, our sister, or our friend, women are critical to our health and well-being. The women we know and love keep up with appointments, inquire about how we're feeling, and look after us, keeping families and communities healthy. Today's town hall will give us the opportunity to discuss with you how as an administration, we're working to make healthcare more affordable and accessible to millions of women and all Americans as we implement the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act is a healthcare law that includes groundbreaking policies to improve the health and well-being of women in communities across the nation. And we hope that this event can help continue the conversation around the many benefits the Affordable Care Act offers right now for women and their families. To help us engage in this important discussion, we have with us a distinguished group of panelists. We have Judy Waxman, Vice President at the National Women's Law Center, Kaya Lewis, Counselor to the Secretary of Health and Human Services. We have Kathleen Sibelius, the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services. Cecilia Munoz, Director of the White House Domestic Policy Council. And with us from the media, we have special guests joining us. Margarita Bertzos, health editor of Red Book, a popular women's magazine reaching 8 million women across the country. And Kelly Wallace from iVillage, a popular social media site that reaches 30 million unique visitors each month and a newsletter that reaches 5 million women per month. Thank you all for being here. A panel of experts, but most of all, a panel of individuals dedicated to improving the health of women and their families. Before we begin, let's remind ourselves why we're here and kick things off with a video. At HHS, we recently launched an initiative to showcase stories of Americans who know firsthand the new programs, benefits, and rights under the healthcare law and how it impacts their life. We call the initiative, My Care. You know the saying, a picture's worth a thousand words? Well, a video's worth even more. The video we're about to share tells the story of Robin and her son, Jax, of Maryland. I'm healthy, I have great health insurance through my job. Never really thought that this bill, this law, would really affect me quite as much. And then I got pregnant with Jax. Jax is a twin. He and his brother were born in August. Um, in my second trimester, I found out that Jax um, was diagnosed with trisomy 22, which is a genetic disorder called cat eye syndrome. And along with that, along with several other possibilities, he had a heart defect. They were born at 36 weeks with a C-section, and Jax immediately went to the NICU, and he spent three weeks there. In the three weeks time, we found out a lot of things weren't going to be something we had to worry about that was part of this genetic disorder, but um, the problems with his heart were more severe than they thought. His heart is actually on the wrong side of his body. His intestines are backwards. He may have vision problems. He might have cognitive problems, but the heart was the most concerning thing at that time. After three weeks, they sent him home, to grow and develop so he could be a little bit stronger for his surgery that he would need. Um, they sent home a fairly listless, kind of blue baby. Uh, we took him to a lot of doctor's appointments. It was very stressful. We had to make sure he wouldn't cry too much or his heart would stop. We'd have to call 911. Um, oh and we have his twin and two-year-old sister as well. Um, so it was a very stressful time. In November, we took him um, for his surgery. He responded immediately. He came out a pink baby. He moved a lot. It was a, an amazing difference. 
the first day in the NICU was over $150,000. If he, in five months, used up the lifetime limit for him, my family would be in really dire straits. He's going to have to have follow-up visits, potentially follow-up surgeries. We would move mountains to pay for health care for this child. We're very glad not to have to. Quite a story. Uh, we are fortunate to have Robin and Jax here with us today. So thank you, Robin, for being here. This is what today is all about. It's about Robin, it's about Jax, it's about the millions of others across the country that have been touched by this law in some way. Hearing from women, talking to women, and having that conversation about what this law means, not on paper, but in real life. And our next speaker knows a thing or two about working with people across the country to help them feel more connected to this administration. Here to help welcome us to the White House is Tina Chen, Assistant to the President and Chief of Staff to the First Lady and the Executive Director of the White House Council on Women and Girls. Tina most recently served as Deputy Assistant to the President and Director of the Office of Public Engagement. So she definitely knows a thing or two about connecting with people. Today, we're lucky to have her join us. Tina? Uh, well, thank you, Myra. Um, and as you talked about your mom um, in your opening remarks, um, I hear that actually today is the anniversary of your birth. It's your birthday, so happy birthday to Myra. <laughs> and Robin, welcome to the White House. Welcome all of you to the White House. I have to sort of recover a little bit <laughs> from hearing your story. Thank you for sharing your story because it's so important in getting this message out. Um, and thank you all for being here, and we really do want to welcome you to the White House. I'm delighted to be here and with both my hats on, as Myra described, both as Chief of Staff to First Lady Michelle Obama and as uh, Executive Director of the White House Council on Women and Girls. Uh, a little bit about the Council on Women and Girls, um, for those of you who don't know about it, um, it was created by the President by executive order in March of 2009. Um, it consists of every part of the federal government, so all of the federal agencies, all of the major White House offices. Um, and as the President said on the day that he created the Council, his intent was to make sure that every part of the federal government pays attention to the needs of women and girls in what they, agen our agencies do in their everyday work, um, and then in the major initiatives that he has been promoting um, throughout our administration. So in those three years, I'm proud to say we have done things um, like support equal pay. The first bill the president signed into law was the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. And we've just spent this week supporting passage of the Paycheck Fairness Act, which we're going to keep working on. Um, we have our Race to the Top program that has promoted STEM education for girls. We have the first ever White House advisor on violence against women who has been promoting initiatives across the federal government to fight against violence against women. And we're going to continue also to keep fighting for the Violence Against Women Act, now pending in Congress. Um, and we've made historic investments in Head Start, um, tax credits to working families, support for women entrepreneurs. But today's topic is something we've also devoted um, a tremendous amount of time because of its importance, because it touches the lives of so many women and their families across the country. Um, and that is health care for women um, and the President's historic achievement in passage of the Affordable Care Act. Um, and we're going to be discussing the many ways today in which the Affordable Care Act has really touched the lives of women and girls, their families across the country. And so one of our, the President's really strongest supporters in this, one of the great spokespersons for women and girls in our country, um, is our next speaker, who I'm delighted to welcome to the podium, who's a dear friend of mine, who is the Chair of the Council on Women and Girls and Senior Advisor to the President, Valerie Jarrett. Thank you, Tina, and good morning, everybody. Happy birthday, Myra. We're delighted to have you and everyone here. One of the real advantages of the White House is our ability to convene. 
and um, our Office of Public Engagement that Tina used to run and that is under um, my portfolio, our whole purpose is to reach out broadly around the country and make sure that everybody's engaged and informed and has a right to participate in our dialogue. And so I want to look around this room and I see all of these amazing women and a couple of brave men who came in <laughs> as well. You're welcome. We're glad to have you. Um, so welcome, everyone, on behalf of the president. Uh, and thank you, Secretary Sebelius, for coming over and helping us organize this as well. As uh, many of you know, I've known the president just a little while. It's now 21 years. <laughs> I was just a child when we met. <laughs> uh, but over those 21 years, I've been so struck by how he gets the issues that are so important to us. And not just as a politician and now as the president of the United States, but as um, a person who grew up with a single mom and he watched the challenges that she faced, who lived with his grandparents for a while, who helped raise him, the father of these two incredible young daughters, uh, and married to this terrific woman, and now living in a household, as he describes it, where he's completely surrounded by women, his daughters, his wife, his mother-in-law, all he's got is Bo, really. <laughs> uh, and he mentions that quite often, but I think it really has informed his decision making. And he is the first to mention that one of the worst moments in his life was when his daughter Sasha, as a baby, uh, was rushed to the hospital extremely ill. And he said there just was nothing more painful to him. Or watching his mother die at a very young age before she had a chance to even know her grandchildren or before she had a chance to watch his ascension to be President of the United States. And so he has been struck by these issues at a very human and deep level. And I think that that's so important to have a president who comes to the table um, with an appreciation for what and how important women's health is for us. And so I think, as we all know, the Affordable Care Act has been a tremendous, tremendous piece of legislation that is helping uh, women and families all across our country. And what the president believes is that quality health care is not a luxury. And it can't come with a luxury price tag. Not when so many people are at this make or break moment, those in the middle class and those trying to get into the middle class. The president knows that there are folks around our country like Joyce Morgan of Charleston, South Carolina. Thanks to the Affordable Care Act, Joyce has a security that comes with knowing that her 23-year-old, her daughter Emma, can stay on her own health plan until she turns 26. Emma, along with 2.5 million young adults who now receive health insurance through this provision. And a couple of years ago, right after it was passed and implemented, my own daughter, Laura, uh, finished school. And she had a gap between the time she finished school and the time she started work. And she was searching through um, all of the possibilities for health care. And I said, Laura, have you looked at the provisions of the Affordable Care Act? <laughs> you can now come on my insurance. And I can tell you, I certainly slept better knowing that she was able to join my insurance and wasn't forced to take on those exorbitant um, costs if she'd had to pursue her own. And of course, that's just one of the many provisions of the Affordable Care Act that helps women and girls. But not all women have equal access to health care or similar health care outcomes. Low-income women and women from racial and ethnic minority populations often have higher rates of disease, fewer treatment options, and reduced access to care. They are also less likely to have health insurance or usual sources of care for populations as a whole. Latinos, for example, are twice as likely to be diagnosed with cervical cancer. And while breast cancer diagnosis is diagnosed um, only 10% less frequently in African-American women than white women, African-American women are 36% more likely to actually die from the disease. This law, as you all know, is actually making a difference in people's lives. Thanks to the Affordable Care Act, more young people have health insurance, more community health centers are treating more patients, more doctors are treating people who are living in underserved areas. From screening for cervical cancer to gestational diabetes, and yes, contraception, the president has fought for access to care and services that will protect women and families and build a healthier nation. When it's fully implemented, it will do even more. But we know it won't reach its full potential without your help. 
And so I want to thank you for the work that you do each and every day, for being with us here today. And I want to encourage you to raise your voices in your communities to ensure that Americans know about their rights. It's so important that people know what's available to them and the benefits under this law so that they can live longer and, of course, live healthier. So thank you for being here. And now I have the distinct honor uh, of introducing to you the head of domestic policy for President Obama, Cecilia Munoz, who will come up and give also some additional remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. I'm going to be very brief, but welcome also to the White House. Um, we're really so excited to have you here. Um, this is so important for all the reasons that Valerie and, and Tina have talked about. It's also, for, I think, certainly for me, I know I'm speaking for the panel, I suspect I speak for the room. This is personal, right? This is about advancing health. This is about making sure people have access to coverage. This is about making sure when you have coverage, you get the services you need and they can be affordable. All of these things have been accomplished by the Affordable Care Act. And I say this as, as a policy wonk, right? I'm responsible for domestic policy in the White House. I say this as a woman, as a mother of daughters, as the daughter of a woman who fought breast cancer for 18 years. This is personal. Um, we know that as women, we're often sort of the gateways to, to health care and coverage and, as you heard, make, making the appointments, making sure everybody in the family gets taken care of. We worry about affordability. My mother, during her illness, worried a lot about the women who didn't have the coverage that she had, the women that she saw getting treated, the women that she knew weren't getting treated because they didn't have access to the coverage that she had, uh, which helped extend the, both the <coughs> length and the quality of her life. This is personal. And what we've accomplished in the Affordable Care Act allows us not just to treat conditions once they happen, but to get ahead of conditions that disproportionately affect women of color, for example, like diabetes, like cardiovascular disease, like certain forms of cancer. The fact that for people with coverage, preventive care is available without co-pays and co-insurance is huge. Um, it allows us to get out in front of these conditions before they become emergencies, before they become more costly, not just in economic terms, but in terms of how they affect our lives. So uh, as Valerie said, we're so glad you're here because this is personal. It's important. It's important to our well-being. It's important to the country's well-being. But access to preventive care uh, and the other kinds of services that are available under the Affordable Care Act is only going to be meaningful if people know that it's there. The fact that uh, you don't have to struggle with life that lifetime limits to your health insurance coverage, people need to know that that protection is there. The fact that people with pre-existing conditions have access to care, that you can't discriminate against children with pre-existing conditions, will matter the most and have the most impact if people know that those protections are there. So that's why we're here. That's why we're having this conversation. We are so excited to have you here um, and so really excited about the important impacts that this law is already having and the impacts which are on the way. Um, and with that, I have the great privilege of uh, introducing someone that um, I, I love working with. We are so lucky to have her as a Secretary of Health and Human Services. Uh, this is, she's someone who's a fighter and has been throughout her career, um, not just for health care, but for a whole uh, array of things which move this country forward. Um, uh, Secretary Kathleen Sebelius. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome. I think it's great that Myra had a birthday party for herself and invited this <laughs> dazzling group. Um, and I'm really pleased to join Valerie and Tina and Cecilia in welcoming all of you today. I think we're going to have a, a great panel discussion, but I just wanted to um, frame a little bit of the discussion um, that we're going to have about some of the reason that we're all here. Um, I don't think there's any question that the Affordable Care Act is the most important women's health law in at least 50 years since Medicare and Medicaid were passed. Uh, Cecilia just went over some of the new benefits, um, but I think it's also really important to understand what a difference this can make for women in the insurance market. Um, what we know is that women at some point in our lifetimes are likely to be in a situation where we're out purchasing insurance on our own, uh, between jobs, uh, after retirement, losing a spouse, uh, we're going to be in that market. And in the past, 
that has been a devastating market for women to be in. Um, first, you had to kind of get in the door of an insurance company, and that wasn't easy. Insurance companies could deny coverage to women for anything from being a breast cancer survivor, like uh, Cecilia's mom, to delivering a baby by C-section, which I have done and a number of us have done, to being a victim of domestic violence. That would put you outside the market. They could just deny coverage altogether. Um, now, if you were young and healthy, um, insurers could still charge you up to 50% more. That's still going on around the country. Up to 50% more for the same coverage that your male colleagues were able to get. And that me meant just being born a woman was, in insurance parlance, a pre-existing condition. <laughs> being a woman was already a black mark against you. One study, um, I think it's Judy's study actually, and she may be talking about it later, found that that disparity, that extra money charged to women, costs a billion dollars a year. That's money out of our pockets that could be feeding our kids and paying for rent and buying groceries. Then, adding insult to injury, even if you could find coverage and afford that coverage, there was a good chance that the plans didn't match your needs. Um, what we know is about 50% of the plans in the individual market, those women buying coverage on their own, don't even cover maternity coverage. Many of them lack any kind of prescription drug coverage. They don't cover mental health services. So you were paying 50% more and then paying 100% out of pocket for the services you really need. Um, and finally, you pay extra money, you get the coverage, you pay out of pocket, you're all set to go, right? Not so fast. Because insurance companies, up until the Affordable Care Law was passed, could dump you out of the market if they found a technical mistake in your form. And what we found, unfortunately, were patterns of real abuse. Companies targeting breast cancer survivors and finding in their algorithms how to go back through their forms and try and determine if there was any reason the so-called rescission really meant you were thrown out of the market, even if you were paying your premiums on a regular basis. So it was not a market that was very women friendly. The deck was stacked against really all Americans in that small group and individual market, but especially against women. And what we've done with the Affordable Care Act is put some basic fairness in place. Uh, first, by 2014, it will be illegal to discriminate against anyone for pre-existing health conditions. It's already, as Robin knows, illegal to dump kids out of an insurance policy because of a pre-existing condition. That went into place right away. But by 2014, that will apply across the board. Secondly, it's illegal and will be in the new market to charge women more than men simply because of their gender. That's a huge step forward for women in this country. We will no longer be our own pre-existing health condition and that day is long overdue. Third, the coverage that we buy will cover our needs. What an interesting idea that you will have an insurance policy which actually looks at women's health needs and it's not just our department, it is really the Institute of Medicine that was charged with looking at the gaps in health coverage and including now the services, preventive services, contraception coverage, maternity care. So when you buy an insurance policy, you will have some confidence that it really does cover your health needs. And fourth, there's a patient bill of rights. It stops insurers from dumping people out of the market. That's already the law today. It makes sure that there are no longer lifetime limits, as you just heard in the compelling video we saw, doesn't affect a lot of people, but the people it affects, it's a life or death situation. If you run out of coverage in the midst of a expensive chemotherapy treatment or when your child is born needing follow-up care, you can really be in a terrible situation. So I've had a great opportunity <clears throat> Excuse me, and how do you like that technique? <laughs> Pretty good, huh? Good. Chuck Todd didn't get it right away, but you all know how to sneeze and cough. Um, I've had a great opportunity in the last few months to travel around the country and have the living room conversations that you 
just saw about today. We've been talking to women throughout the country about the Affordable Care Act and how this law is already impacting their lives. I've met mothers of young children, uh, moms who can now keep their children on their health plan, as Valerie just described with her daughter, Laura, up until the age of 26. Women who are battling diseases like breast cancer, whose lives literally have been saved when they became part of the pre-existing condition plan, which now covers about 60,000 people across this country who had absolutely no health insurance because of their health condition and now are alive based on the treatment they're getting. Now what the law meant for them, for all of us in this room and for women across the country, is peace of mind. Peace of mind that no matter what the circumstance is, whether they need insurance because they get divorced or want to go out and be an entrepreneur and start a business or finish school, or because they're a blogger or a freelance journalist, care will be there, affordable prices will be there, and coverage will be there that you need. And that's really what the law is about. Now, we're going to open up for questions in a minute, but before we do, I want to introduce another person who was featured in the My Care Initiative, Helen Rayon. Helen is a senior joining us today from Philadelphia. I had the privilege of being with Helen a few months ago, and she does have a wonderful story. So let's take a look at Helen Care. I do have more peace of mind with the health care reform. I'm gonna get some good numbers, right? Perfect. Hopefully, yes. All right. The act is helping me as a senior because I know that I can get certain screenings and medications without having to break the bank. And I can go ahead and get my examinations, screenings on time, and get my evaluations and results so that I can take care of any illness that might be arising. I've seen the availability of some preventative care that patients maybe couldn't otherwise afford or even thought were important, just such as mammograms, uh, flu shots, colonoscopies, all those things play an important role in keeping people healthy. Hey. How are you? All right. Can you? Hi. I am a grandmother who is trying to assist the grandson with his education. I take seven different medications. Getting the donut hole closed, that gives me a little more money in my pocket. Patrice. I have a message for you. I work at a senior center. I have been working there now for nearly six years. I do get energized at work. So you've been having trouble with your back. How are you feeling? Well, I have to set up workshops and programs that will help them with their health and wellness. So many of them are so much older than I am, and their spirits are so high. When I see that, it picks me up. If it weren't for health care reform, many of our seniors would not get to a doctor or get mammograms. It is expensive for us to keep good health. Health care reform will help us so much to know that we can get certain things at a cheaper cost, a lower cost, or no cost at all. The health care law is about people like me. It's Helen Care. My comments were principally about the private market and what's changing, but Medicare is also changing, and Medicare is a women's health program. The majority of beneficiaries in Medicare are women, and as you work your way up the age ladder, more and more of the beneficiaries are women. So having preventive services without copays, having the opportunity to do annual wellness visits, which were never a part of the Medicare program before, closing the donut hole, which is a key part of Medicare, have really been part of the Affordable Care Act to strengthen Medicare for now and into the future. So now let's get to our conversation. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, we are all thankful as a, 
employee of the Department of Health and Human Services. We're all thankful for your leadership and dedication on this issue and so many others. Um, so we've had a great welcome from some fabulous women leaders from the Obama administration. But now it's time to hear from you. Like Cecilia said, the, the important benefits and rights and protections made possible by the Affordable Care Act really only matter if the American women know about what's available to them now and what's coming down in the future. So I want to get this conversation started. This is a town hall, and we're going to kick it off by going to our distinguished panel and open it up to our media guests. Uh, Margarita, can you give us a question from your audience at Red Book? Absolutely. Thank you. So I think one of the things that we're, we're dealing with as journalists is that the law seems to be... Sorry, thank you. One of the things we're dealing with as journalists who want to communicate to our readers what's available to them is that the law is affecting different groups of people in different ways at different times. And so I think that, you know, similarly to a picture being worth a thousand words, a, a headline is worth a thousand words, but we don't know what the headline is because it seems like every, you know, different subsets of the population will have a different headline. So can you help us understand a little bit what we need to be communicating to readers? Absolutely. I think one of the great benefits of having media participants as part of this panel is to give us a better insight of what people need to hear and in what format. One of our great initiatives is the MyCare initiative. Um, Secretary Sebelius, do you want to take that? Sure. Um, I'll give it a stab and others can join in. Um, I think one of the things about the Affordable Care Act, because it is a very significant um, and comprehensive piece of legislation, it is phased in over time. And in part, that's to get the new markets right. Um, a number of the benefits went into effect right away. Uh, young adults staying on their parents' plan was a 2010 advancement. Children not being denied coverage because of pre-existing health condition went into effect right away. Uh, some of the Patient Protection Act, so no rescissions any longer. Companies can't dump you out of the market. No lifetime limits went into effect right away. So the changes around Medicare went into effect right away. Annual wellness visit, um, gradual closing of the donut hole, which this year is a 50% discount for seniors on the drugs they're purchasing once they hit that coverage gap. Um, those are in effect. And what is coming in 2014 is really the new markets, the state-based health markets called exchanges where people will um, be able to purchase coverage in a larger pool. You don't have to join an organization or do anything. You will just be eligible to do that and have competitive prices um, and some knowledge of uh, the fact that all insurers will not be able to pick and choose based on pre-existing health conditions. The best, and, and we've talked about this a little bit, Margarita, but everyone needs to know there is a very good website at healthcare.gov, uh, which gives a timeline for the, um, this comprehensive bill. What's in place now, what's coming, and really what impacts an individual and her family. A lot of us may be caring for an older parent, so you need to know about the Medicare benefits along with what might affect you. Healthcare.gov also has right now a first of its kind snapshot of the current insurance market. So if you are purchasing coverage on your own or a small business owner trying to find coverage for you and your employees, um, there is an ability to put in a zip code answer a couple of health questions, and get in place side by side every product that's in the market now and what they're charging for that insurance. So in the short term, uh, there's that availability. Two other things which are in place right now um, are this pre-existing condition pool, which operates in every state around the country. So people who have been denied coverage because of a pre-existing health condition didn't have any other option now have an option uh, for some coverage. Um, and small business owners, and a lot of women are small business owners um, who are looking for coverage for their employees, there are tax credits that began to be effective starting in 2010 to purchase employee coverage to kind of stabilize that market. So a lot has happened already, and a lot more is coming in 2014. 
Absolutely. And I think if you think about just the couple of minutes that the secretary spoke, she named small businesses, she named preventive services, she talked about lifetime limits. Uh, each different issues that speaks loudly to certain populations, certain segments of your readers, Margarita. And I think if you're talking to someone about business and women, or if you're talking to someone about families and women, I think there's a different aspect of the law that can speak more clearly to those audiences. Um, Kelly, do you have one uh, from your audience? Do I have one? <laughs> I know. We had so many questions, many of them from our iVoices on iVillage. These are our real moms and dads who contribute videos to iVillage on the issues they care about most, and I love them. Some of them gave three or four part questions, so <laughs> I won't ask them all, but this is one from Beth Engelman, and she's a single mom. I think she has a six-year-old in Chicago. And she wanted to know, how is the new uh, health insurance bill going to affect my family's premiums? Will they go up? I think that's a question some people have been asking. And she also asked, how will the health insurance bill help promote preventative care for children? That's a great question. Yeah. I think a lot of people want to know, know the details. Uh, Judy, you represent an organization that speaks the voice of millions of women across the country here in DC every day. Um, what, what, what do you tell women that come to you to ask those similar questions? Um, well, many of the points that have been made already, of course, are, um, are ones that we talk about quite a lot. And um, s some of the things that uh, I think a good answer, maybe for Beth, would be that there are provisions in the law that will make insurance companies more accountable and more transparent in the premiums that they charge. Uh, it's kind of a little known part, I think, but I will say it is already having an effect. Our own insurance at my organization in the past has gone up 10% a year, and this year actually went down. And when we ask, <laughs> yeah, I don't expect that to happen every year, I got to say. But um, we did ask, uh, you know, our insurance broker and company, why is that? Although we had strong suspicions why. And they did say it was the Affordable Care Act. So, uh, and it is because the companies now have to limit how much they can use of the premium for profits and for administrative costs, and they have to be transparent about it. And that is a really uh, important step for all of us now and, of course, way into the future. Absolutely. Great. And then the second question about what's in there in terms of preventative care for children in the, in the health care, Affordable Care Act? Well, I think um, it starts with the uh, fact that it's now illegal for companies to deny coverage to children. That was never the case in the past. And, and companies could do one of two things. They could either just say, we won't cover your child at all. If like Jack's, he was born with a pre-existing health condition, he could be written out of the family plan. Or we won't cover the things that Jack's need. So we won't cover, we'll cover Jack's, but not his heart and not his, that was, again, totally legal. It's called medical underwriting. You just eliminate um, conditions that you cover. Uh, that will no longer be legal. Um, so you start with broader coverage. And then there is a directive um, in the bill that um, in addition to looking at the recommended preventive services for women, that we also uh, look to uh, the listing of preventive services for children, and those become automatically updated and part of what is kind of an essential benefit package for an insurance plan. So you can be confident as a parent that if you buy health insurance, um, your ch child will be covered and that the preventive services from childhood vaccines to recommended treatments will be not only included, but updated on a regular basis. As the science changes, as the science improves, that is automatically added to that benefit package. And again, um, don't have to read the fine print, don't have to go to page 32 and you know look through the paragraphs to see what it really says about coverage. There's some confidence there that the insurance policies actually will cover and be updated in that coverage. 
Absolutely. I think, you know, the coverage of preventive services without cost sharing requirements speaks to women and families across the country. I mean, it's a tough economy out there trying to figure out if you're going to pay a $40 copay for a mammogram or $40 for groceries for your family. I mean, it's a decision that a lot of families have to face today. Doing away with that cost sharing requirement really speaks loudly to some of our most vulnerable uh, women and families across the country. You know, Valerie this morning talked about how Latinas across the country have cervical cancer at a rate twice the general population. And African American women are dying from breast cancer even more than the diagnoses are happening, right? That's because they're not going to the doctor to diagnose these cancers early enough to catch them, to get the treatment they need to live healthy lives. The Affordable Care Act doing away with those cost sharing requirements is going to make that much more possible. So let's continue the conversation and open it up to our great audience. Do we have any questions? <laughs> Few. Okay. I'm going to take it to the back. How, Keith, can we ask sure. her to come to the front? Yes, please. It's also Keith's birthday. It is. <laughs> One of the few wise men who's here. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. My name is Alana Elias Kornfeld. I'm the executive health editor at Huffington Post. Um, my question is about integrative medicine and the place that integrative medicine has in the Affordable Care Act or any of your other initiatives and how that would specifically um, impact women's health. Thanks. I think, oh, go ahead. So can you tell us exactly what you mean by integrative medicine? Because I know people use it different ways, and that'll help us. Sure. Um, Alternative. Treatments that uh, are, don't require surgery or drugs, perhaps. Um, preventative care in the way of nutrition, lifestyle changes, the uh, promotion of better sleep. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and acupuncture, homeopathy, energy work, I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, I can take a stab at that and happy to have others jump in. But um, the preventive health services that will now be required to be in everybody's plan, this is um, whether you are getting new coverage or you have existing coverage over time, Every plan will have to cover a long list of preventive services without cost sharing, as we have said. So some of the um, um, services we've already mentioned, and they are what I'll say more traditional, like mammograms and pap smears. But there's also, not everything you named, but there also is nutrition counseling. There is also going to be, starting in August, counseling for domestic violence, uh, a, an attempt to start moving towards requiring coverage of all these kinds of um, discussions and conservative breastfeeding pumps and counseling. Um, those kind of things that will move us in the direction uh, of looking at people's health rather than just their sickness. So it doesn't cover everything, but of course over time that list will be evaluated, as the Secretary said, new evidence will help that list expand. And I think this law does make a big shift in our thinking about what health care should be. Should it just be looking at sickness or should it also be making us more healthy? I would say then on a state-by-state -state basis, um, as you know, a lot of uh, states have adopted a wide <coughs> range of um, alternative treatments and methodologies uh, that they include in insurance packages. Others haven't. And so as states put together their own state-based exchange, those benefits will also um, be available to be added. So it may vary a bit depending on um, the discussion and the dialogue in that state, uh, but those decisions are kind of wide open until 2014, and um, in some of the therapies that you described, uh, probably more <coughs> appropriate at the state level, it, what 
Judy is describing is kind of the national framework which sets a floor for coverage and then there will be some variation depending on those discussions at the state level. And you raise a great point though. I mean, when you talk about health, we all define it differently. When you talk about health care, we, we approach it differently. Um, one of the main components of the Affordable Care Act is the creation of the National Prevention Council, uh, of which 17 departments, federal agencies, offices comprise this council and talk about prevention and public health and health promotion. Um, and one of the specific charges is to look at integrative medicine and to discuss that issue. We have an advisory group of national experts on public health, two of which are specifically looking at integrative medicine um, as their top areas of research. So we're excited to have that conversation and seeing where we can go in the future with it. Okay, let's do the <laughs> red jacket. <laughs> Lots of questions. Hi, my name is Linda Murray, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Baby Center, which is an online resource for pregnant women and new moms. Um, our question from moms is, what do you mean by affordable? Is there a target for affordable? Um, we had several moms tell us, family of four, they're paying $1,000, sometimes more, for the health care for their family. That exceeds, in some cases, their housing costs. So is there a target for affordable, and what does that mean? Go ahead and take it. Yeah, go for it. So I'll start. I mean, the if you follow the debate closely, I mean, we all were very, very deeply engaged in it. You heard the president say multiple times that among the many goals, of, but a prominent goal of the Affordable Care Act is to bring the cost curve down. Right? We've been on the wrong trajectory for a long time of costs escalating, and so the the panoply of things that you're that you've heard about are really designed um, to to bring the cost curve in the other direction. So while there isn't a specific target. Um, each of the policies that you've described, in, including prevention, right, and in some ways that's almost self-evident, right, that if you get in front of conditions before they become emergencies, it's less expensive. It's, it's better for people's health, but it's also less expensive um, by you know, treating folks in a preventive way rather than it, folks ending up in the emergency room. It has a cost-saving effect. The fact that um, insurers, as you heard Judy describe, have transparency, they have to explain, they, they have a limit to how much of your premium dollars they can spend on administrative costs and profit. That again has the impact of transparency, but it also has the impact of bringing the cost curve down. So the, the law was crafted in a way that was focused both on promoting health, but also on this notion of, of the fact that costs were moving in the wrong direction. And just as an economic matter, the goal is to bring them in the other direction. I think also in the, in the part of the market that is um, really broken, uh, individual and small group market um, is really fragile and a lot of people there are paying 100% out of their own pocket or trying to pay 100% for themselves and their employees. Um, the framework is that if you and your family fall below 400% of poverty, you will qualify for government assistance, a tax credit, to come into that market. So it recognizes that if you work often for a large employer, you have a balance. The employer is paying a portion of your health coverage and you pay a copay or you pay coinsurance. But for a lot of people, they don't have that. They don't have that other stream of income. So when you're paying 100% out of pocket, expensive is expensive. Um, this actually creates a framework recognizing that um, a lot of people who are uninsured and underinsured don't have that other stream of income. They're entrepreneurs, they're farm families, they're out on their own shopping for their own coverage. So 400% of poverty and below, you will qualify for a tax credit that can make the insurance product more affordable. In addition to then having that tax credit, what we know about the market is if you make companies compete side by side and offer products based on quality and service, prices come down. Competition is actually a market strategy. That's one of the other issues in the exchange. And thirdly, we know that on average, people with insurance coverage right now are paying about $1,000 more on their own insurance coverage for everybody who's uninsured. Because folks are coming in through the doors of emergency rooms, they're accessing health care, but they have no payment. So when you um, have a stay in a hospital. Your hospital cost is actually higher to compensate for those folks who are in the hospital who have no coverage. 
bringing everybody into the market again lowers costs overall and it's estimated by the CBO that premiums will go down uh, across the board based on competition, based on, as you've heard, the, the new 80-20 rule, which says 80 cents of every insurance dollar collected has to be spent on health care costs. And starting this year, people will begin getting rebates. Companies that haven't met that 80-20 rule, who are spending 25% or 30% on CEO salaries and advertising costs, We've been collecting that data, and starting this year, money will be going back to folks, to consumers, to employers for their health plans based on not meeting those rules. So there are a whole series of, I think, things that will bring costs down. Absolutely. So I know we're all excited, but we have an online audience as well. And I was handed, <laughs> I was handed a question from our Twitter audience that asks, what does the law do to protect specifically low-income women? Kaya, you want to take a shot at that one? Sure. Well, I, I think um, uh, the secretary outlined what sort of makes this affordable. Um, I think for particularly low-income women, we know that the uh, income limit to be covered by Medicaid is going to be expanded in 2014. And so now anyone uh, under 133% uh, of poverty will now be covered by Medicaid. This is important because before, we had categorical coverage in Medicaid, and so if you were a single woman with no children and weren't pregnant, then you just weren't eligible for Medicaid, and men too, without children, uh, no matter how sick you were or what your income level was. And so we will see coverage for uh, Medicaid expanded, which will allow uh, uh, many low-income women to get the coverage they need um, to have uh, their um, preventive services uh, be covered and they'll be able to access care. I think also what's uh, really important is that because of the investment in preventive care, um, we know that oftentimes um, if you're having tough times economically, you haven't been able to get the health care that you've needed. And now with the Affordable Care Act, because we're allowing people to access mammograms, pap smears, and other preventive services without cost. It'll allow people who haven't been a part of the system before to be able to get that baseline preventive care they need to understand how they can manage their health uh, moving forward. Um, there's one, one additional point I would add to everything Kaya said, which is that um, under both the Affordable Care Act but also the Recovery Act, there's a substantial expansion in community health centers in this country. An additional three million people are being served at community health centers already as a result of the changes this administration has made. And uh, there's, uh, there are more uh, grants online to continue to raise the number of people who are served and actually expansion of the physical facilities of community yeah. health centers. So even as we wait for the Affordable Care Act to fully come online in 2014, yeah. there is already an expansion in access to care, particularly for low-income folks who are traditionally the folks served by community health centers. Absolutely. That's a great point. And actually, because of the investments of the Affordable Care Act and the Recovery Act, when you look at our health centers, our hospitals, they're often economic engines in some of our most underserved communities, in communities nationwide. And because of the investments we've made, we've seen employment at health centers grow 15% because of the investments. It's a tremendous opportunity to not only provide critical care services, but also job opportunities for people across the country. Okay. Okay, let's do the woman with the pearl necklace. There are many women with pearl necklaces. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, good morning. I'm Linda Kramer Jenning, the Washington editor for Glamour Magazine. And we had a question from one of our readers about why can't state governments dictate where federal health funds, how can they dictate where federal health funds are allocated? She's concerned about what some states are doing on Planned Parenthood, for example. So the question is why, why can they or can't they? Um, well, it, it is a concern about women having access um, to services and women having a choice about what services they want to access. Um, so our department, and I, I do want to recognize um, Dr. Nancy Lee is here, who's head of our um, Women's Health Office. Um, Dr. Mm -hmm. Lee is right back there. Um, our department helps to run the Title X program, which um, provides uh, 
family planning services for low-income women and has been in place for years, uh, as well as the Medicaid program, um, which also provides a range of services. And uh, we are watching very carefully um, as states renew contracts and pass laws to make sure that women in that state have access to a choice of providers, which is required by the Medicaid law, uh, that women have um, a legal right to choose providers, and that in the Title X law, that there are adequate numbers of providers throughout the state based on the population services. So in a number of cases where um, there are states that tried to cut off services that would have impacted um, literally millions of women and their ability to access health services that they need. We have um, been in, I would say, um, active conversations about uh, the need to give us the information that ensures those women have services and have a choice of providers. And in some cases in the request to alter their Medicaid funding, which is a state-federal partnership, and again, eliminate services. We have denied those um, amendments because they, in some instances, violated state law. Judy might want to comment on this because she, she and her center have been watching this very, very carefully. Yes, thank you, um, and thank you. I was going to jump in, but I'm happy to. <laughs> um, Basically, what some of the states are trying to do is, I mean, the secretary really alluded to it, the t two things is to, to redirect um, some federal money, particularly through Medicaid. Medicaid is really pays a lion's share for family planning services uh, in the states. And that they cannot do because of the federal law, because as the secretary said, the federal law requires that providers, all providers be able to participate. And so the state simply can't do that. Uh, there is litigation going on in a number of states, but I am confident that that will be pushed back. What the governor or state representatives and uh, legislators are also trying to do is cut their own state funds. And that, of course, is a different story, and that is one that women in the states have to pay attention to. Thank you. Another question? Uh, the woman with the red glasses. Yes, my name is Stephanie Phillips. I'm founder and editor-in-chief of BeccaStone.com. It's a website for mothers of black children. And um, my question is, um, it's been a long history uh, it's documented of um, minorities receiving, uh, having disparities in uh, access to health care. And I was wondering um, what incentives or programs are in the Affordable Health Care Act to ensure that minority communities actually receive the benefit and take advantage of the preventative services that are now covered by the Act? Well, it's a great question, um, and one that uh, I have to tell you, if things keep me up nights, uh, that's one, is we have documented health disparities for generations. We haven't done a very good job of, of closing those gaps in, in health coverage. I'd say the passage of the Affordable Care Act in and of itself is a huge step forward because having um, a health home, having uh, the ability to access affordable health coverage is a big step forward for lots of minority families who right now don't have affordable health care and we know end up um, not accessing a doctor's visit until something acute happens, not getting the checkup that could prevent, you heard the difference in breast cancer deaths, for instance, uh, early Screening early detection we know saves incredible lives, but finding it late is a death sentence. So the difference of having a mammogram and not having a mammogram can sometimes um, be absolutely critical. So passing the act, having preventive services with no co-pays is again taking down another financial hurdle uh, that people had. If you have to have a 50 or sometimes $250 copay for a colon cancer screening or a mammogram or 
to get your kids vaccinated. You may not be able to do that on a regular basis. Um, so that's another big step, but we really need your help. I would say that's a great question because looking forward to 2014, um, access is a piece of the puzzle, but it's only an opportunity. It only matters if people actually enroll and engage, if they know what's coming, if they have some time to think about what's good for them and their family. So part of what we're beginning to have conversations about, and we would welcome all of your readers and listeners and bloggers and tweeters to be well informed, um, help us with strategies of how to reach particularly the most vulnerable communities, the people who need the services the most, who have the least um, amount of sophistication. Often they're not sitting online on a computer. Uh, they may not be following the fact that there is now a law that's passed that's going to have some benefits for them or a law in effect right now that has some benefits for them. So we really welcome at the department ideas and strategies. Uh, we're trying to partner with faith-based leaders, with community leaders, with healthcare providers, with business leaders, with certainly uh, women's groups and media folks to try and begin to get the message out that the law is changing and that benefits are on their way. But thoughts and ideas that you all might have about things we could do better, partnerships we could have, we will have community outreach workers begin to work on this and uh, again tell people that a change is coming and um, how people can enroll. And part of what we're doing is trying to make sure that when someone is ready in January 2014 to enroll perhaps for the first time in healthcare, that it is as simple and as seamless as possible, that uh, the person doesn't have to figure out what they are eligible for or qualify for, that they can pick up a phone or go on a computer or go physically to an office and that there will be one gateway for that person to come into the market. If they're eligible for Medicaid, they and their family will be enrolled in Medicaid. If they're eligible for an insurance exchange, they will be given those choices, but that the experience should be simple, easy, one-stop shop for folks to become engaged in the health system. But your ideas and thoughts about what we need to do, the communities we need to work on, how to reach out to the most underserved and um, vulnerable communities would really be welcome. Absolutely, I mean, I think that's one of the main reasons we're having this conversation today. I mean, this town hall is an opportunity to have that discussion with real people across the country, with leaders in the administration to talk about what do women need to hear about the benefits available to them today, whether it's, you know, via Twitter or Facebook, or if it's an application like Text for Baby that's been very successful with underserved communities across the country, how can we learn from those efforts to make sure that by 2014 we'll be ready? Um, so let's take it back to our media panel. Uh, Kelly, let's go with you this time. Do you have a question from your audience? I do, I do. And this comes from Sharon Rowley. She's a mom of six. Mom of six. Wow. <laughs> She's very busy. <laughs> and, she, <laughs> and she said, with the economy being so tough and people losing their jobs, one of the toughest things they have to face right after the job loss, we all know, is how to deal with maintaining medical insurance. And we know often the only option available is to take the coverage covered by COBRA. But since the employer is no longer paying a share of the coverage, the cost for COBRA, we know astronomical and sometimes just not possible for a family who lost their income. So her question is, what other options are available for people in this situation? Well, as um, she said, and I, um, it is a very tough situation. Um, COBRA coverage, when you're paying 100% of what your employer coverage uh, is, um, not affordable for lots of families. So a couple of things. The children, um, the six children, may now, because of the family income level changing dramatically, may qualify for programs they didn't qualify for with a fully insured family. So that would be one thing to check out, whether they qualify for either Medicaid or the children's health insurance program, which is based on income levels. But since the family income level has dropped pretty dramatically, that could be an option for now. Um, if one of the parents has a pre-existing health condition or a child has a pre-existing health condition, 
there are the pre-existing health condition pools which are also in place so trying to fill gaps in the marketplace and the site online healthcare.gov could give them a snapshot of what's in the market at what price and it gives you a range of you know how high a deductible how to lower pre you know do you want to look for a lower premium so that may be an option uh, for the family and then no in 2014, um, there will be a series of options that may not be available right now. Expanded Medicaid coverage for uh, the lower income, and for the first time, as Kaya said, around the country, regardless of where you live, you will qualify for Medicaid at a, at a standard rate. So that is an option. And then tax credits available for the next um, group of, of income up to 400% of poverty in the new health insurance exchanges. So there are whole, there's some options now and many more on their way, um, but the family might be able to find coverage for the kids and different coverage for the adults that, that is more affordable than ongoing COBRA coverage. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's one of the greatest benefits of the Affordable Care Act is this opportunity to buy health insurance in the private market in a way that's easy to understand, transparent, and you're able to purchase the coverage that's right for you. So 2014 is just around the corner. <laughs> uh, go in the back. You, Kim. Kimberly, I don't know if people can hear you. Could, would you mind walking over to the microphone, please? Hi, um, Kimberly Nez McGuire with the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health. Um, I wanted, so we've heard some about how the ACA will help low income folks and communities of color. I was wondering if some of the panelists might speak to how the ACA will help LGBTQ Americans. Uh, well, you know, there is a great provision that a lot of people don't know about, and I can tell you it's section 1557. Because <laughs> everybody knows what that is. Right. In our office, everybody knows what 1557 is. And it is a non-discrimination uh, provision that has not existed in the past, and it is built on other civil rights laws, but translates them to, I mean, I should say, brings it over to health care. So um, LGBT is not mentioned directly, but sex is. Uh, so there cannot be discrimination on the basis of sex in health care. It's more complicated than that, but that's basically uh, the way it goes. And I'm happy to say the department in writing regulations, HHS, the secretary, thank you, and the staff, interpreted that provision in the exchange regs as saying that did extend to saying there could be no discrimination on the basis of sexual identity or sexual orientation. So this is a step into acknowledging that there is discrimination that lots of us don't want to think about but does exist in healthcare and it is a way to make sure over the future that that is eliminated. So we can thank the ACA for the law and we can thank the secretary for the interpretation. I, I will not pretend to be a lawyer because I am not, mm -hmm. but I do want to say that Section 1557 is in effect and is already being enforced by our Office of Civil Rights. And just to, to build on what Judy said, um, sex discrimination in case law has generally covered gender identity. And as a result of that, it's going to speak volumes to the LGBTQ community across the country. Uh, another question from the audience, please. Can I add just one thing oh, I'm sorry. Um, to the LGBT issue? Um, we are also, for the first time ever, going to add um, questions on LGBT health issues to the National Health Survey. It's never been done before, so a lot of what's been done in healthcare for LGBT persons has been based on anecdote, not on data, and that will be a huge step forward. Absolutely. Um, can I have someone with a green badge? Sorry. No one has a green badge that has a question? <laughs> here you go. Okay. Keith, over here. Over here. Oh. I'm just trying to be mindful of our audience. <laughs> Um, I'm Amna Boss on behalf of the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum. Um, I think some of the panelists have spoken today about some of the challenges that women of color 
and low-income women experience. Um, one of the issues is that there's not a lot of data um, for communities like Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders on you know, what exactly is happening on their health and how can providers and researchers work together on good policy solutions. So can you tell me a little bit more about how the Affordable Care Act is going to help our researchers and providers better serve these communities? Absolutely. I, I think it's going to build on what the Secretary talked about, LGBT data collection. Kaya, do you want to take that? That would be section 4302 <laughs> <laughs> for the wonks in the room. But the Secretary just mentioned it. The Affordable Care Act actually uh, uh, directs the department, and we've already done so, to collect race, ethnicity data, primary language data um, throughout our surveys and our, and our programs. So that's already started. The secretary mentioned we'll be adding um, LGBT um, sexual orientation questions to our surveys. And it's such a good question because we, we can't tell where we're going or how we're doing if we don't have data on all of our populations. And um, there are populations, many uh, in the Asian Pacific Islander community that are smaller populations and we don't really even see what the disparities are until we start breaking out uh, ethnicities amongst. And so that's going to be something that really advances um, what we do at the department and allows us to see how we're doing, how we can improve, and how we can begin to, to close those gaps. Yeah, and specifically within the Asian Pacific Islander community, and there is such diversity between different segments of that community, to have that granularity in our data collection efforts is going to be able to better give us the understanding of what the needs are so we can met, meet them better in the future. Okay. Um, um, woman in the black jacket with the blouse. Thanks for letting me describe you as I call you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Susan Campbell with Women Heart, the National Coalition for Women with Heart Disease. And um, one of the things that I'm interested in hearing more about um, with the women's health issue is that when women get access to care, which we're all talking about, that's, that's very important for prevention. But with heart disease and other diseases, it's a lifelong issue. So access to care will help quite a bit with secondary prevention, so that if you have an, a health issue um, with good access to care, um, better information, you can maintain your health. And I just thought you might want to speak to that, because I think that's really important for women's health as well as for the healthcare system in terms of saving dollars, et cetera. Well, Women Heart um, is a great partner uh, in a great leader in um, reminding women that heart disease is, is something we all need to be conscious of and deal with. And I've been delighted to um, have a chance to work with Susan. Um, the um, part of what, it, again, is not well known, a lot of people understand that the insurance pieces of the Affordable Care Act. What is not as well known are um, the major effort in the Affordable Care Act to really improve patient care. Whether you have insurance or not, frankly, care is kind of mixed and spotty. Uh, some care is very, very good, and, and providers do absolutely the right thing for the right patient each and every time. And in other places, that doesn't happen so much. And so. Um, one of the efforts is to identify some areas where we know there's some best practices and try to make them national best practices, have everyone and an effort underway under the umbrella of the uh, Innovation Center, the first of its kind kind of research and development center that Medicare and Medicaid has had. Um, money is actually being put into uh, helping identify best practices, inform providers about them, uh, make them national models, uh, begin to pay on strategies that we know produce good outcomes. And one is the Million Hearts campaign, which Women Heart is very much a partner in. And, and it really is about um, the fact that we, we know we could prevent a million heart attacks and strokes, a million heart attacks and strokes in the next five years by doing some relatively simple protocol. And it's really the ABCs. Uh, Aspirin protocol for people where it's recommended who have um, heart indications, uh, blood pressure control, cholesterol control, and smoking cessation. 
those are the underlying elements that uh, if um, a patient is at risk for heart disease or has had a heart attack, that we know can be a management tool. And in, unfortunately, even with people with insurance, um, there are lots of folks out there who are not managing their conditions, who, who know that they have high blood pressure and are not taking steps to lower that blood pressure, who do not take the aspirin regimen to keep their heart um, on a more normal course, who are not managing their cholesterol, and so they're at very high risk for another incident. And part of that effort around a million hearts, but there are lots of those protocol underway to try and really improve care for all patients. And frankly, it also lowers costs. You, you, you know, hear a lot of that discussion about, well, you can't possibly lower costs and improve care. You got to do one or the other. Absolutely not true. If indeed we prevent a million heart attacks, that's a lot of hospital days, it's a lot of follow-up care, it's a lot of very high health costs, which actually won't happen. So the keeping your blood pressure under control is a whole lot, not only better for the patient, but a whole lot cheaper than a second heart attack and those hospital days and those follow-up costs. So you really can improve care and lower costs, and that's part of the direction of the Affordable Care Act using strategies that we know work and we know are in place in pockets in areas but are not being followed by every provider every time for every patient and trying to put together systems that make that happen. Yeah, that's a great point. It really underscores the fact that the Affordable Care Act isn't only going to help the over 30 million people that will get health insurance come 2014, but it's going to help the millions of us that have health insurance today so that when we go see our provider, we're going to have more time to spend with them. We're going to be able to have our questions answered. We're going to have a quality care experience that we're all expecting when we go to our hospital or, or clinic. Um, so that, that's a great point, and thank you for that question. Okay, woman in the black jacket. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are many of them. That's a really dangerous <laughs> identifier. That's about she was giving me the eye. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. <laughs> My name is Jerry Pemberton. I'm with the Black Women's Health Alliance of Philadelphia. I'm also an RN and I'm also a patient. Uh, seeing many disciplines in uh, health care providers. And I have a concern and question about whether the act will cover um, Collaboration between different health providers as far as the documentation and some uniform uh, process uh, that they can use, uh, which would cut down on uh, duplication of tests, et cetera. Absolutely. Um, I, I can start it. So um, one of the many provisions of the Affordable Care Act is the concept of community health teams to do just that, to make sure that providers from nurses to physician assistants to doctors are really working collaboratively to give the patient the full continuum of care. Um, the Secretary alluded to this, but the new Innovation Center at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services just recently launched um, the support of 26 innovation awards across the country where generally the federal government funds these demonstration projects based on our great ideas for what works for healthcare. These awards flipped that and decided the communities, the states, bring us your ideas. What is uh, improving quality? What is saving costs? And apply for these funds and we'll take a look at what you're promising to do and we'll support those initiatives. And we launched that first set, the 26 awards, just a couple of weeks ago. So you're looking at models of care to incorporate community health workers or to focus on prevention in Indian country to try and figure out how these new models of care can save dollars to the system and improve quality of care. A number of those awards looked at ways in which uh, providers can have those partnerships. Well, I would say um, in addition to what um, Myra said about these innovation grants, what we know is a couple of things, and it's been demonstrated over again, um, that the health systems where the providers work in collaborative teams mm -hmm. have by far the best results. Um, and so that's a model which is not only effective in uh, reducing everything from hospital-based infections, when everybody's empowered to be part of that safety culture, to um, lowering costs and delivering more efficient care. So we are funding lots of those models, medical home model, 
uh, when a patient is either at risk of going to the hospital or has been released from the hospital, which really involves a team of workers that actually try to help keep those patients healthy in the community. Teams in hospitals and everything from team training to team collaboration around um, hospital-based issues are also uh, part of the funding package. So there are lots of strategies that really recognize that by far the best care is delivered when providers talk to one another. And I would say a huge platform for this, pre-Affordable Care Act, but it's very exciting work that's underway, is the conversion of all systems of care to electronic medical records. And that does three things really quickly. It, it first of all, gets rid of a lot of paperwork. Um, it um, enables primary care providers and others to coordinate care. They know what tests have been done. They don't have to duplicate tests. They can see care strategies. And it gives information to patients for the first time that they own, they control, they can monitor. So we started three years ago when this president came into office. Less than 20% of doctors and only about 10% of hospitals in this country used any kind of comprehensive electronic record. I mean, think of that. Mm -hmm. So you can't measure care. You can't figure out what's going on. You can't share care strategies. People were exchanging paper. I don't know how many of you got the famous clipboard. You go into a provider's <laughs> office, and it's like you fell off the face of the moon, right? You start all over again with who you are, where you came from. Um, so we are now at the point where we have about, we've doubled that number. We have about 40% of hospitals, and we're on track to have probably half of the primary care providers by the end of this year involved with a comprehensive record, and the trajectory is on its way up. So we will have a system of communication, measurement, um, identification and information, patient empowerment for the first time ever in this country that um, I think also gets to some of the uh, strategies that we know are very effective, but it's harder to do that if you're changing paper files, if the nurse doesn't know what the doctor really ordered, if nobody can follow the prescription and see if it's been filled or if it's the right prescription, you don't know what test has been given, uh, that system is changing. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, woman in the blue with the no sleep. Hi, I'm Sarah Austin. I'm the features director at Self Magazine. I wanted to ask about the kind of black cloud hanging over the Affordable Care Act, um, which is that the Supreme Court could overturn it uh, as soon as next week. I'm wondering if the administration has a plan of attack for if that unfortunate circumstance should come to pass. Well, I would say we um, still remain confident and optimistic that this um, change in the law was well within the purview of Congress. It fits into about 70 years of expansion of the Commerce Clause. And clearly, as we've discussed today, uh, people who are outside the health market impact the health market each and every day um, by either not having or not purchasing insurance, you influence the price of the marketplace. Um, having said that, you know, we'll be ready for um, court contingencies. What we're doing right now, frankly, is just working as hard as we possibly can to get ready for 2014. Um, because the, you know, the range of options that the court was asked to deal with are, are broad. We think that it's, it's the best preparation to you know, anticipate that the law is fully constitutional and that people are eager to be eligible for these new marketplaces. And frankly, some of the deadlines are pretty daunting to set up new markets in states around the country, to work on the kind of expansion programs that we're talking about, to do the outreach and communication. So we're well underway uh, doing just that, and we'll continue to implement and then, you know, uh, be ready. Absolutely. Okay. Yes, woman glasses. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, hi. I'm Melissa Ford from Blogger. Sorry. I'm Melissa Ford from Blogger. A follow-up question to that is, what can be undone at this point, and what couldn't be undone based on the Supreme Court's decision? Well, the plaintiffs actually, in a couple of the cases, have asked that the entire law be struck down, that it be found unconstitutional. And one of the appellate court judges agreed with that. The other. Um, I think four or five did not, but one has. 
Um, so much of what we've described here today uh, would cease to exist. Uh, young adults on their parents' plan would no longer be the law. Insurance companies could go back to rescission policies, could continue to charge women significantly more than men. There would not be assistance or a new market without pre-existing health conditions. Uh, that would not be the law uh, any place in the country. We've had two years of incredible changes and improvements to Medicare, stabilizing uh, preventive services. Uh, um, we assumed that would be unraveled because those would no longer be the law. We'd have to establish new Medicare rates because there are some increased rates for doctors providing primary care and prevention care that are part of the Affordable Care Act. Um, the money that is currently available to states to begin to set up this new market would stop. Um, so this would have uh, 60,000 people who are now on pre-existing health insurance plans uh, who could not get insurance coverage anywhere else. Um, that Those resources that support those plans would stop. Uh, so it, it has some pretty cas cataclysmic uh, impact uh, along the way because really we've had two years of implementation and millions of Americans have preventive service benefits, have... Uh, you know, contraception as part of their health plan, have the ability to get immunizations for their kids with no co-pays, and um, we assume if the court would strike that down, uh, those all would cease to be the law of the land. It's hard to believe that an hour and a half has passed by. So we've got, had a number of questions, but I've neglected our Twitter audience. So I'm going to go back to that real quick, if you don't mind, for our last questions, which is a little more specific as to the preventive services um, available specifically for women. In August of 2011, the department released important guidelines to cover key preventive services for women's unique health care needs across their lifespan. Uh, for the women on the panel, uh, can you share what specific preventive services that means for women across the country? Some examples? I have my list right here. <laughs> Wonderful. Last year. Okay. I need okay. someone <laughs> So wait, here I got it. Um, and there are eight <clears throat> Pardon me, eight of them. So all of these services starting August 1st for new plans when they begin. So again, uh, by January, as I heard the secretary say recently, the majority of plans would be affected by this, and over time all plans will be. Here are the eight services. Well woman visits. Screening for gestational diabetes. HPV DNA testing, if you're 30 or over. Sexually transmitted infection counseling. HIV screening and counseling. FDA approved contraceptive methods, the full range of contraceptive methods and counseling. Breastfeeding support supplies and counseling and domestic violence screening and counseling. That is quite an incredible list. Thank you, Judy. Uh, absolutely. And I do think, you know, the opportunity to have a well woman visit, to have an opportunity to sit down with your doctor and either access these services or have that conversation about what services are right for you, a conversation that should be between a woman and her health care provider, is a key opportunity that the Affordable Care Act is going to make a reality. So it's an exciting conversation to, that we're starting today. Um, so at this time, I want to wrap up our panel, but really bring it back again to the real people across the country that this law is impacting uh, day to day. Um, uh, again, I want to introduce one final MyCare video for you, and this one specifically features Abby Shanfield from Minnesota. Uh, so if you could share the video, please. Without the Affordable Care Act, my life would be very uncertain and very scary. My name is Abby. I'm 20 years old and I'm a student at the University of Minnesota. I was born with a rare congenital disease called toxoplasmosis. It's a parasitic disease and one of the many side effects is extracerebral spinal fluid on your brain at 10 months old. I had the same size head that I do now, at which point they implant a shunt that drains the fluid from your brain 
And since then, I've had four shunt replacement surgeries. When I was 17, I started to lose my vision in my left eye, and I almost lost all of my sight completely in my left eye. Usually vision is the first sign that something's going wrong. I need to have preventative care in order to take care of myself. Otherwise, the ramifications could be terrible. And there's no cure at this point. It's going to be the rest of my life. Two eyes. Yeah, two. My whole life I've been covered by health insurance thanks to my parents and my family helping to pitch in and pay for those premiums. So I've been very lucky and I have always had excellent health care. However, there was a point before the Affordable Care Act was passed, I was very concerned about my future and whether I'd be able to access care. I found out about the provision in the Affordable Care Act that I can stay on my parents' plan until I was 26 immediately. That was one of the most important things in the law yeah. and one of the most powerful things for me in my life. There's things I can't do about the future, but this has really helped her future. Given that the Affordable Care Act has passed into law, I have a world available to me. You can't guess what life will toss at you. Even if you don't have a health issue now, like I do, that's uncertain and everybody deserves a chance at happiness and a healthy life. The healthcare law is about people like me. It's Abby Care. And we are lucky to have with us here today, Abby. <laughs> I know we're running short on time, but I think we want to invite, you know, our special guests to say a couple of, of words. Um, sure. Okay. I, hi, everyone. I just wanted to thank you for all being here and for having me. And Thank you, Robin, for your inspiring courage into the Obama administration for fighting for the health of all Americans. My name is Abby Shanfield, as you saw, and I was born with a rare disease called toxoplasmosis. Thus far, I have been incredibly lucky, yet my future is uncertain. What side effects of my disease will emerge throughout my life is impossible to tell. But I do know that I will be dealing with the physical and monetary implications of my condition for the rest of my life. Since I was very little, I have understood that I am limited in what I can do, where I can travel, and the possibilities available to me. That is why the Affordable Care Act is so much more than a law. It is a safeguard against the unknown as well as a protection from insurance companies using the terms pre-existing condition or lifetime limit to dictate the type of job I can get, where I live, whether I can access the proper antibiotics to protect me should I choose to have children, and most importantly, it protects me from insurance companies and businessmen putting a price tag on my life. The ACA is a monumental step toward an America that is inclusive and doesn't leave some to falter while others thrive. Without the ACA, I could still be told that my life is not of value, that it is worth only a finite amount of money, and I am too great of a burden on society to have access to a full and healthy life. The Affordable Care Act is a reflection of America's values of justice and equality and assures more Americans' futures will be defined by our collective hopes and dreams rather than our fears of the unknown. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Robin and this is my son Jax. Um, as you saw earlier in our video, Jax was born with a congenital heart defect that was part of a um, genetic disorder called trisomy 22. Um, 
He was in the NICU for three weeks. He had open heart surgery at three months old. He was in the uh, cardiac unit for 10 days after that. He's had 30 doctor visits. He's gonna have another surgery at the end of this month. We are so relieved in our family about this law because we don't have to take a list and do the math to decide which doctor's appointments are important. His heart, obviously, that's important. Maybe his eyes, we can decide not to take him to do that because that possibly won't kill him. Um, we are so relieved that that's not a decision we have to make. We're also so relieved that when this boy, 26 years from now, when I'm really old, um, <laughs> that we don't have to worry about the pre-existing conditions he was born with when he's finding health insurance on his own. We're so thankful to um, Dr. or Kathleen Sebelius, sorry. Um, and we're so thankful for this law and President Obama for making sure that our family is protected. Hello. I'm going to be very, very brief. As you saw on the video, I am the senior. <laughs> I am the active senior who has been involved with senior care as well as ch child care for more than 40 years. So my appreciation to the Affordable Care Act is that I can continue to be as active as I have been because I know I will have these services that will be provided for us. So we wish that you will fight on and on, and we will assist you with the fight. Mm, that's good. Thank you. Thank you again, each of you, for being here with us. Um, it's our honor to have you here. Uh, so at this time, I want to give a special thank you to our panelists for joining us today, our invited guests. Um, for being with us, and as well as those of you here in the room with us, and the many of you that are viewing online for being part of today's town hall conversation. We're going to continue this conversation in the weeks and months and, and years to come as we continue to implement the law, as we continue to make sure women and families across the country know about the important benefits available to them. Uh, keep up with our uh, updates via Twitter at our handle at healthcaregov, or in Spanish, at HHS Latino, and also on our Facebook page. Uh, just a couple of closing housekeeping things. For the media in the room, if you're interested in interviews, please take a look at the birthday boy. He's in the back. He's the one that was walking around with the mic. He could uh, help coordinate those interviews. And for those of you that are staying for the important breakout sessions to go a little bit deeper into these issues and learn more about what we're doing uh, to improve women's health, uh, if you could look at the color code, there's a screen here that explains to you which room corresponds with your color code. If you don't have a color code, don't worry. Pick a breakout room and we welcome you. Um, so again, thank you for being part of this important conversation. We look forward to continuing to work with you and talk with you about what we can do at the department and across this administration to improve women's health. Thank you. <laughs>